hundreds of millions of people every day come to Google and ask questions about their health. How do you meaningfully define the impact when artificial intelligence meets medicine? Taking of a human level intelligence and putting it at the computer in a way that we would recognize as seeming intelligent. So I think with great data comes great responsibility. History has not been written and predicting the future is very hard. So welcome to the program, Dr. Michael, and it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. So live from bedside critical care to Google Health boardroom, how did the shift happen? So I, uh, I worked clinically for a long time. I was training or practicing between 1995 and 2017, did a lot of clinical time, uh, ran parts of hospitals, and I um, began to see that machine learning started working in healthcare when it had not before. And it, it ha a bunch of it happened at Google. And most of my career had been working on quality and safety. And then my, my academic area was this area called healthcare delivery science of how do we tell if something works in the real world and how do we take research quality math that usually just lives in the lab and make it work. And that fit really well with Google. And so I um, joined uh, as one of the early hires in the current health efforts at Google. So undoubtedly, Destiny had some other plans for you. <laughs> We were, I was trying to decide what to do and, um, you know, you're, you're an emergency physician. I'm an intensive care doc. Like I'm not normally a hand wringer. Like I normally can decide I was having trouble. And my daughter who was nine years old at the time looks at me and says, dad, I've noticed that when you talk about the Google people, you smile a lot. I guess we will go to California. Hun. So on a personal side, I just wanted to know, I'm curious to know, do you miss being a clinician? I miss being a clinician terribly. It's the one thing I don't like about my job is that you know, I don't get to take care of sick people directly. So what does a day in the life of Google Health Chief Clinical Officers look like? Tell us more about this. It's probably a lot like your life where you fight with email, go to a lot of meetings, like probably probably the same. Um, the, the, the more serious answer is that I, I try to spend time thinking about my team and what is it that we bring to Google? Because we, we believe that when you make new technology and you have a clinician and engineers and product managers together, that you get better products. The second is I try to think about what are the technologies that are being invented today or about to be invented? What are the applications that they may have in healthcare and that we can help bring to bear in a way that makes sense to hospitals and doctors and regulators. Um, and that's a pretty fun job. Um, and I think that the other thing that, that, you know, we take very seriously is that we have um, six products that more than 2 billion people use every month. Um, hundreds of millions of people every day come to Google and ask questions about their health. There are 200 billion YouTube videos that are related to health that get watched every year. And there are 8 billion people on the planet. Um, and so anything we can do to make the quality of information a little bit more helpful and a little better, a little more authoritative, a little more accurate, helps millions and billions of people. That's definitely a lot of work. I can clearly see that. Oh. So everybody's talking about AI in healthcare. I'm sure that's definitely the buzzword. Yeah. But how do you define or how do you meaningfully define the impact when artificial intelligence meets medicine? Yeah, I think that there are, the first thing is, so, so AI is the taking of a human level intelligence and putting it at the computer in a way that we would recognize as seeming intelligent. It's a concept that, the second important thing is that there are different kinds of AI. And so it's a concept that's been around since the 1950s. And medicine and AI have been intertwined since the very beginning. The kind of AI we have today is different than the kind of AI we had in the 2010s. 
and the um, that the way that we think about it in healthcare is when is there something where better information or better accuracy would help the patient or the doctor? And we see that as one of the places where a- AI can bring the most good. But Dr. Michael, don't you think there's a fine line between technology helping doctors and uh, human touch? So how do you think that Google is uh, helping this or differentiating this? Yeah, it it varies by your kind of practice around um, how many things, you know, I don't know in your practice of if you have to do 100 things, how many of them are with a patient helping them? And how many are dealing with administration, writing notes, following up on things? Um, one of the places that we're seeing really early wins with AI is in taking out the administrative burden from clinicians and letting them spend more time with the patients. And that, um, that, that I think, is really precious. Because when you're sick, you, sometimes you want to be alone. But often you want a human being to help you. Hopefully AI can help, uh, help us all do that a little bit more. So you mean to say artificial intelligence is here to stay in medicine and it's making a big impact? I think so. I, I think that the history has not been written and predicting the future is very hard. Um, but over the past couple of years have been the first time that I've been truly hopeful about technology making a real difference for clinicians and patients on a global scale. So on the other aspect, most of us think or worry is about the privacy. So how do you think that Google is protecting the privacy of patients as far as AI in healthcare is concerned? Yeah, there there are two ways that we think about that. So the first is, are your data private and are they secure? Because if they're not secure, they're not private. We have very many teams that work on that every minute of every day of every hour. Um, And in particular in healthcare, we've seen more and more and more cyber attacks. And so we've seen evidence now that the ways that we protect things like the cloud turn out to be more protective than things that are, you know, on premises. And so there's a whole bunch of things that work in the nuclear power industry, that work in banking, that also work in healthcare for security. And then for privacy, if you're an individual person, you should have, it's your data, right? You should be able to say, um, I'll give an example on Google search. You can set it to delete your, auto delete your data after three months or 18 months and so that you don't have to remember to go back and do it. I'm sure we all do this. Yeah, I, it's a, um, I forget what the default setting is today, um, but it's a, it's a very commonly used setting uh, for people. In healthcare, for enterprises, there are a couple of things we do. So for when you, as, an, as a hospital, um, put your data in the cloud, you control the security, we don't control it, you can control the encryption keys. Um, and then the second piece is, are there things that AI brings uniquely to that can be a privacy threat? And there are. And so, you know, if you, one of the things when you're looking for a cloud provider is that they should be able to guarantee that if you train an AI on data in your cloud, there's no way that it can leak to another customer. Um, so there are some things that AI is u- has unique uh, problems, but they've um, uh, we have good insight into what those are and ways to mitigate them. So I think with great data comes great responsibility. So how do you see the ethical guardrails evolving around AI in healthcare? Yeah, I think that the, the guardrails for healthcare help us out a lot here. That the, the idea of if you focus on the patient and focus on what's good for the patient, focus on autonomy and beneficence and non-maleficence and all of the traditional um, bioethical frameworks, that it works quite well for AI and healthcare. And, but the, 
the words around the bioethics can sometimes be blocking. But if you keep the patient at the center, all else will follow. So on a personal note, Dr. Michael, what excites you the most about uh, artificial intelligence in healthcare and what keeps you going? I, I'm excited at how fast AI is getting better right now. If we look a year ago, two years ago, it was pretty amazing, but it keeps getting faster and it feels like it's getting faster at getting better. Um, and the other thing that I'm excited about is seeing the startup community and healthcare really begin to embrace it. Because we, we know we can help make the foundational technologies and do the foundational research. But I think where it will really take off is when, you know, thousands or millions of people begin to build on top of it, understanding what it's like in their hospital ward, in their clinic, in their community. Pretty excited about that. So let's fast forward 10 years. So how do you think a typical hospital visit would look like? I mean, thanks to AI and all the robots around. <laughs> I feel like I should ask you that question. Um, so, so I think if we think about care today, when you go and get care, at least when I get care, it's cold, it's impersonal, and it's fragmented. And it's filled with waiting. You know, the fact that you have a waiting room tells you that you're going to wait. What, a, what is it going to be like, let's say, 50 years in the future? We're pretty confident that you'll get care when, where, and how you want it. That you'll have all your health data and you can control who you share it with. We're pretty confident that AI will help do a couple of things. One is it will level information asymmetry so that you have the ability to ask, you know, the world's best information to get help and it will support your doctors. And I think we know that the results will be higher quality of life and living longer at lower costs. And I'm pretty confident that when my daughter's children are grown, that's how healthcare will be. And I think the question for all of us is, can we pull that far future in closer into 10 years? I'm hopeful that we can. So I think the question to ask is whether AI will be helpful in health sector or not, but how far and how fast? Yeah, I think it's like asking, would electricity work in the health sector? Yes. How are you going to use it? Well, who would have thought when electricity came that we would have ventilators and ECMO and life support machines. But we do because of this foundational technology. Um, we need people's creativity to figure out what the future looks like. So talking about accessibility, Dr. Michael, how do you think that Google is ensuring that the power of AI in health sector is not just reaching the urban communities, but also the rural hospitals, which uh, we think is very important? Yeah, one of, one of the things that we think a lot about is the global reach of the access to technology. You can really see that in Android as a good example, where more than two billion people every more than two billion people every month use Android to help access the internet and the world, and that's likely to be the portal into AI. Anyone within with an Android phone today. And nearly anyone with an Android phone today can begin to access AI like Gemini um, just on their phone. Or if you Google something now, um, one, one of the things we've learned is that people often ask questions that can't be answered on a single web page. And so if you ask a complicated question about your health and the answers are splayed across 10 different web pages, wouldn't it be really helpful to have an AI to summarize that into the actual question you ask? That's how AI over it is works on search. So what's that one health tech myth that you would like to bust on air today? That the first is that I, I would like to clear out the idea that AI is new. It's not new. The idea has been around for 50 years. We've had different kinds of AI supporting us for easily more than a decade. The specific kind of AI that we have today is new. Um, and I would like to clear up the idea that there's not 
evidence for AI in healthcare. Our team has published more than 150 papers on this on this area. I do think that we need more evidence, and we certainly we're working on that. But there, there is a there is an emerging body of evidence supporting um, how AI actually works in healthcare. And finally, what message you would like to share with all of you us out there as far as AI and healthcare is concerned? I mean, how should they prepare or what should they be prepared for? I think the most important thing today is to get your hands on one of the modern AIs. Ours is called Gemini and play with it. And that sounds silly, but until you've poked at it and asked it questions and shown it the photographs that are around and begin to get an intuitive sense for what AI is like today instead of what it was like in 2018, um, it's hard to then imagine what it would be like in your clinical practice. And so start in a low stakes area, play with it, spend a little bit of time, and then begin to invent the future yourself. So thank you, Dr. Michael, for such an inspiring and thought-provoking session. It was really wonderful interacting with you. Thanks for having me.